Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. As you're turning there, uh, someone noted this week, they said, I thought we already covered the seven churches. And I, I would like to share with you, we did cover them as a group, but as you'll see this morning, each one of the individual churches is unbelievably rich in the truth that taking apart the, the historic, grammatic, and, and cultural context will bring to pass. So we're going back through only focusing on each one. But as you open to the second of Christ's seven personal letters to individual churches, we are looking at Smyrna. That's Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And as we read these words to this church that Christ wrote, starting in, in verse 8, the historical context is that the church at Smyrna was going through the second wave of persecutions that struck Christ's church. Now, just reading this, you just... It could be any time in history. But knowing the context of what the church was, uh, geographically where it was located, and the time frame when John dicta or Christ dictated this to John and he delivered it, it gives us an incredible insight. Because the church at Smyrna was going through the persecutions that every church in the first century had to endure. So the first lesson is this. I want to give you a short history of early church persecution because most of us kind of struggle with putting things historically in order. And, and so just for you to understand, there were three waves of church uh, persecution that just swept out across the empire. There were many. In fact, historians say 30 Roman emperors persecuted the church, but there were three main waves. And as I share this short history of church persecution, someone told me this week, they said, you know what? I could save the first half hour of the message. I could stay home and Google everything you say. And I thought, that's an interesting concept because what they don't realize is that, that though the whole world is at our fingertips with Google, it's not seen through the lens of Scripture. In fact, you don't even know if three-quarters of it or nine-tenths of it's even true. But see, background is a part of expositional preaching. And to understand the historic, grammatical, and as well as the theological, as well as the cultural context, is so vital and has always been a part of teaching the Word of God. So for the rest of you that are willing, if you bear with me, I'd like to give you a sanctified mind's analysis of church history, something you'll never get on Google, okay? even if you do stay home and read it. Uh, and the reason I share this with you is because church history records and posts with it events that you can see in the Bible. The first one, the first wave, was the Emperor Nero. And that was from 54 to 68 AD. And if you know anything about Paul's life, this was at the height of Paul's writing ministry as he's writing epistles from 54 to 68 AD. This persecution was sporadic, kind of like Nero's life. Nero was just sporadic. It was limited mainly to the city of Rome, but what we know from the scriptures is it swept up two people, Peter and Paul. A lot of others, but those two, you know from, from the scriptures, those two were swept up by Nero's persecution. The second wave, which is the wave that Smyrna is in, is the emperor Domitian. Now he reigned from 81 to 96. This persecution was much wider than Nero's. Nero was just looking for a scapegoat because he had a hard time ruling with all of his dissipated lifestyle. But Domitian, uh, across most of the Roman Empire's provinces, hit the church. And we know from the Bible what happened because this is when John, the one who God used to write Revelation was exiled to Patmos because of this very emperor, Domitian. So wave one, Nero sporadic. Wave two, Domitian wider, and it wipes out what is going on in Smyrna as well as putting John on Patmos. The third wave is the emperor Diocletian, and this persecution, and he reigned from 285 to, uh, or 284 to 305, but this was the greatest of any Roman emperor's persecution against the church. This was the closest that Christianity ever got to extinction. Domitian, uh, whose palace is now the modern-day city of Split in Croatia, uh, was an amazing administrator. He just went through life, and he administrated and organized the Roman Empire. And as he was administrating and organizing, and most of his administration 
uh, is what preserved the empire for so many centuries. As he was going through, he found an anomaly, a group of people that wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. And so he just administratively said, let's get rid of them. They were called Christians. And so he began three things. Number one, he says, I want to get rid of every place they meet. And they systematically destroyed every church meeting place of the Christians. He says, secondly, I want to get rid of whoever's leading these little rebel groups. So they killed every known pastor. Finally, he said, I understand that they have uh, something that they all get their instructions from. He says, I want every single one of those Bibles destroyed. The final nearly 10 years of Diocletian's reign from history show us he systematically decimated Christ's church. In fact, the main reason that there is not a single complete manuscript of the Bible today from before the 4th century is because of him. He succeeded and came the closest ever in history to exterminating the church. And he destroyed every copy so that all we have are fragments, 20,000 plus fragments and partial manuscripts. Under Diocletian's wave of persecution, every church meeting place that could be identified was pulled down. Every pastor that could be found was martyred. And every copy of God's word that could be discovered was destroyed. Now it brings us to another event that took place from Diocletian. Have you ever wondered why they call the largest church in the world the Roman Catholic Church? Why isn't it just the Catholic Church? What's the Roman part? Well, that gets us to Smyrna because the result of this empire-wide extermination of Christianity was the rise to power of a different emperor. And his name was Constantine. And Constantine was a pragmatist. And pragmatists always try and find a way to make the best of the situation. And so he saw that the empire was convulsed with this, this persecution that was so devastating that, that blood was flowing everywhere but he saw that the more Christians they killed, the more of his own legionnaires he was losing. Because the legionnaires were not being killed by the Christians, they were being converted. And, and the men that led them out to the arena sometimes laid down their armor and joined them in the arena. And the men that led them to the stake sometimes would lay down their, their markings of Rome and join the believers. And he didn't, he was a pragmatist. He says, you know what, this isn't uh, quite the way this should be going. I'm losing my army to them. And so he legalized Christianity. And it's a long story and very interesting. But when the Roman Emperor Constantine designated Christianity as a state church, you know, you ever heard the saying, if you can't beat them, what? Yeah, that's exactly what he did. He also merged all of Rome's pagan worship establishment into this state church. See, Christianity was outcast. The Roman church was made up of, as you would see in the Pantheon, if you ever went there in Rome today, it, it was just every god was brought to the Pantheon and set on the shelf, and we worship all of them, and the one god that was over all was the emperor. And emperor worship kind of glued together the whole thing. And so the blending or the syncretism of truth, that's the early church, with error, those were all the different pagan cults and, and all of the false religions of the east of Rome, is actually what prompted the birth of what we call Roman Catholicism. The Catholicism part is the early church, the holy Catholic church that Jesus started. The Roman part is all the beads and candles and vestments and all the different orders and all the different holidays. The Church of Christ never knew anything about Lent until the Roman thing came in. They didn't know anything about all of this purgatory stuff until the Roman church came in. And they merged the vestments, the holidays, all the holy hardware of the pagans went right into the church you read about in the New Testament. And they merged it together. Well, all that practice and building and superstitions and priests from paganism, when it came into the early church, caused a dilution. Now, fast forward to where you are in your Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 2, because I want to show you the climactic event that prompted that choice that had to be made between Christ or the emperor, between the true and living God or the false and very powerful emperor that was before them. Revelation 2, listen to Christ's words to this church 
that was suffering persecution. We'll read all the way down through verse 11 and then pray. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Revelation 2, starting in verse 8, you follow along. And I will emphasize all the suffering aspects because when Christ's church was going through this wave, the second wave, they were really suffering. Revelation 2, 8, and to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that the center of this message that you gave to fear not, to, to not run from what was coming, but to be faithful even till death. I pray that every one of us today would make a choice that as for us and every conscious action and thought and deed that we will make in the future, we want to faithfully follow you to death. And we want to resist fearing because the days are going to grow darker and the evil one is going to more maliciously and malignantly plot to overthrow your church and deceive. And the love of many are going to grow cold. So I pray that we'd say today, I want to be faithful. Lord Jesus, by your grace, through the power of your spirit resident within, I want to fear not. Teach us, Lord. Help us to be faithful unto death. Help us to know that there is a crown of life awaiting us. Open our eyes. Teach us your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And as you look down at the text, Smyrna was under a wave of persecution. Uh, it, it was more than most of us can comprehend unless you've actually been um, somewhere where the Christians are being persecuted and you felt the, the tension of not wanting to, like even this spring when I was speaking, uh, every cell phone in China is taken away from you at the door and put into a box and, and put away in a, in a closet because they didn't want any person able to have their phone activated and have it known where they were meeting and what they were saying because of the, the fact that in China they spend more money on their internal policing of their people than they do on their entire defense and, and warfare budget because they are so intense on controlling Christianity. But this second wave of persecution that broke over Smyrna had its start way back during the life of Christ. In fact, in 26 AD, the emperor, his name was Tiberius, he began something in Smyrna that was going to affect the people that got this letter about 70 years later when they got it. And that was this. Tiberius set up an altar in Smyrna, and, and it was an altar to him. And he asked the people of Smyrna if they would just come by once a year and if they would just put a little incense on a, a censer, a little charcoal fire, and throw a little incense on it, and it would burst in a puff of smoke, and if in doing that, they were, without saying a word, that Tiberius was God. It's called emperor worship, starting in 26 AD. The emperor Tiberius built this in Smyrna, just 40 miles north of Ephesus, and that marks in history the official start in that city of emperor worship. Smyrna has the dubious legacy of starting this emperor worship. Well, to stay a happy part of the empire, all you had to do is stop by the, the forum area once a year. There was an annual, and I want you to think in your mind the, the pressure this would be. The city would line up, the city clerk would be there, beside them would be a little bowl of incense, next to the incense would be a little charcoal fire, and, and the clerk would, would ask you your name, you'd walk through, you'd grab 
just between your fingers. You'd grab just enough of that powder to just cast it on the fire. And as you walked by, they handed you a little slip that was called a labelli. And it meant that you, it's kind of like getting your stickers on your license plate once a year, show you renewed, you know. It just was a little insurance that you were with the program. Soldiers were standing there. The whole city was behind you. But no one actually in the back of the crowd could see just what you're doing. And it was just, you know, with crowds of people, it was just a little pinch, a little puff, a little walk through. But it was declaring that the true and living God was not the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, and God the Father and God the Spirit, three in one. It was saying Tiberius or the succeeding emperors were God. The whole city streaming by the pinch of powder walking out to another year of peace and security. Think about being in line. If you just go with the flow, your children, your wife, your husband, your friends, your job, your home, everything's secure. But if you don't, if you don't do that, if you don't get your little slip, if you believe that only Jesus is Lord, if you say Caesar is not God, Jesus Christ is Lord, they didn't kill you on the spot. The clerk would note that. And the slow grind of the Roman machine would start coming toward you and would arrest you and would force you to recant Christ and to worship the emperor. Well, that's the historical backdrop. And the believers at Smyrna learned how to suffer and die. That's what was going on when this letter came. People were being forced to declare that Caesar was Lord. And the Christians were saying no. And this was actually why the empire-wide Diocletian persecution finally came about, because these Christians and many others across the ancient world refused to go through the flow. The most important decision we'll ever make in life is how we want to die. And the saints in Smyrna wanted to die in Jesus. Look what it says in, in verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. The devil's going to throw some of you into prison, and you're going to be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. You know, the way we should want to die is faithfully. We want to be faithful to death. Well, the pastor of this church was a wonderful example. Because the pastor of this church at Smyrna actually knew John the Apostle that wrote the letter on behalf of Christ personally. His name was Polycarp. He's the last, as far as we know, person who knew one of the apostles face to face. And I would like to just read to you just briefly the account of what he did when, when they made him do the incense thing and he wouldn't do it. This is an account from church history and it's fascinating. The Jews of Smyrna, remember the ones that says were of the synagogue of Satan in verse 9, they were violently opposed to Christ's church. They were blaspheming the name of Christ. They were persecuting the Christians. And this event isn't speculative. This is actually a record that we find not only in, in uh, uh, Eusebius and Fox's Book of Martyrs, but in other places, little scattered pieces of it remain. So we know that this event happened. And this is the record of his death. It was during the time of the public games. The city was crowded with people, and the crowds were very excitable. And suddenly a shout went up, Away with the atheist! Let Polycarp be searched for. He was the pastor of the church at Smyrna. They came to arrest him, but not even the police captain wished to see Polycarp die. And on the brief journey to the forum area, the place where the censer and the incense was, and the crowd had gathered, the officer pled with the old man. What harm is it for you to say Caesar is Lord and to offer a sacrifice and be saved? But Polycarp was adamant that for him only Jesus Christ was Lord. When he entered the arena, the proconsul gave him the choice, curse the name of Christ and make a sacrifice to Caesar or die on the spot. What an amazing scene the church members who probably came to see their faithful pastor were swept into. Well, these words are recorded. Polycarp said, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. Can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Look back at verse 10. Don't fear. Look at the end of verse 10. Be faithful until death. 
and I'll give you a crown of life. So the crowds, church history records, came flocking with burning coals from workshops, from the baths, and so on. They, they came with the fire. And it says the Jews, even though they were breaking the Sabbath law by carrying a burden, they were in the front of the line carrying the wood because they wanted to burn him alive. The soldiers were going to bind Polycarp to the stake in the arena of the forum area, but he said, leave me as I am, for he who gives me power to endure the fire will grant me to remain in the flames, unmoved, even without the security you would give me. So they left him loosely bound in the flames, and Pastor Polycarp faithfully died for Christ. Now that's just one incident from the life of Smyrna, but it's a very powerful reminder that the recipients of this letter took it literally. They believed that Christ was able to keep them. Well, there's a clear lesson for each of us when we face such persecution. It's in verse 10. We hope in Jesus when life is painful. Jesus said, don't fear. In fact, the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible is right there. Do not fear. The entire message for this church is fear not. The most important lesson for each of us from this church is also for us to fear not. No matter what lies ahead in our daily lives, our health lives, our career, our finances, or anything else, Christ's message is simply fear not. Fear is not the realm we are to operate. God has not given us a spirit of fear. The world, our flesh, and the devil do make us fear. But God says, I don't give you that spirit of fear. Don't give in. Don't operate under the basis of the motivation of fear. God does not want that, produce that, nor is he pleased by it. Fear not. Instead, verse 10, Christ says, be faithful, trust me. Why? Why, why should we trust him? We'll go back to verse 8. Because there's something interesting. In verse 8, there's a reminder that Jesus was crushed for our sins. And real quickly, I just want to run by you something that you might not know. The word Smyrna, look at, look at verse 8. It says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. If you take the S off, you might guess what this word really is. It's the word myrrh. Smyrna is what we get in English, the word myrrh. Remember Jesus at his birth, the wise men came, presented him gold and frankincense and what? Yeah, that's Smyrna. It's the same word. It's the Greek word for myrrh. And if you look there, this word not only is the name of an assembly in the city called Smyrna, but it's also the Greek word for myrrh. And myrrh was a substance that was taken from a thorny tree and was the chief product of the city. And the way that it was produced is you take kind of a machete and you go along to the, to the trunk of this tree and you just go whack, 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 whack. And you would injure, you would cut, you would bruise, you would, you would damage the bark. And then for each of the cuts, the healing scab, to use a human term, the scab that would come out to cover the wound, the resin that was exuded from that tree is... The, the raw material from which myrrh was refined. So it's interesting, this was the city of myrrh. And the symbolic message of this spice in the life of Christ is, number one, in Matthew 2.11, at Christ's birth, he came in the form of a servant and endured being born into poverty for us. And he was given myrrh. And Jesus says, hey, I, I know. I know how to make it. And by my grace, you can make it through whatever you suffer in this life. He says, I know your poverty. Look back at the letter. I know your works, tribulation, verse 9, and poverty. He says, I was born in poverty. I was given Smyrna at my birth. Do you see the play on words? Keep going in Mark 15, 23. At Christ's crucifixion, as he suffered the weight of sin and separation from God, for us, he was offered wine mixed with myrrh. Now see, myrrh was also something that would remove pain and anesthetize you to pain. And Jesus, if you remember, said no to his crucifiers who were trying to dull his senses so the pain wouldn't be so bad. Jesus said, no, I suffered the weight of sin and I refused the myrrh that was given to me at the cross. At Christ's burial, though, he was placed in a tomb, John 19, 39 says, he was wrapped in myrrh 
after suffering the wrath of God for us. You see how Christ's whole life and death and ministry are surrounded by this, this little word that was their identity. They were Smyrnian Christians. According to John 19.39, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds of weight, was used to prepare Christ's body for burial in a borrowed tomb. But finally, at Christ's return, I think this is fascinating, when Jesus comes the second time, he's not presented myrrh. When Jesus comes the second time, he's presented with gold and frankincense, but not myrrh, according to Isaiah 60 and verse 6. Because Jesus came the first time as a suffering servant, but his second coming, he comes as the king of the universe. And the multitudes will come, but they don't bring him myrrh because he's not going to suffer anymore. He suffered once for all. He appears as the mighty sovereign Lord, not to suffer. Myrrh is only associated with the suffering present at Christ's birth and death and burial. So from the very name of this city and their suffering, Jesus was trying to teach them something. And that lesson is how to die triumphantly. Unless Christ returns soon, all of us face the inevitability of what Bernie faced on Thursday. Death. You understand that? We're all going to die. Either slowly and painfully, swiftly and climactically, unless Christ returns this week, another tens of thousands of people will die. 52 million people a year, a million a week, die. Well, the Bible teaches us real quickly, and I want to before we end, uh, how, how do you die triumphantly? And that's, that's a question we, we all need to ask ourselves. If Jesus said, be faithful to death, and he said that you can and that you can believe in me, how do we do that? Number one, here's the first example. Because modeled by saints who've gone before us are how to die triumphantly. We saw Polycarp, but how about in the Bible? How about something we can study? Number one, Jacob dies trusting the promises of God. In Genesis 47, he said in verse 19 or verse 29, he says, Don't bury me in Egypt. No, I want to go to the promised land. You see, he was kind of saying what the hymn says: This world is not my home. This Egypt, I'm going to the promised land. You know what else he said in, in chapter 48? He says, The God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who redeemed me from all evil. You know what Jacob said on his deathbed? He declared he's trusting in the Lord. You know why I'm looking forward to Bernie's uh, funeral service tomorrow? Because Bernie, if you knew him, any of you that got to know him, you couldn't get talking to him very long without him saying, Can I tell you how I came to Christ? He loved to declare his trust in the one who died in his place. You know one of the great things to plan right now? You want to die triumphantly? Plan to take that air thing off and go, let me share with you why I'm not, not scared to die, why I'm trusting in Christ. That's how Jacob did it. He didn't have the, the oxygen mask. As they gathered around his bed, read those verses in Genesis. They're remarkable. He says, I'm trusting the promises of God. Number two, his Son Joseph, in Genesis 50, dies pointing to the faithfulness of God. You might decide you want to die triumphantly by talking about his promises or maybe about his faithfulness in your life. Genesis 50, 24, Jacob, or Joseph says, I'm about to die, but God will surely come and aid and take you out of this land that he promised. He says, God is faithful. What he promised, he'll do. You want to die triumphantly? Instead of worrying about who's going to get the stuff and who's going to pay the bill and whether you have the absolute number one best doctor in the world, decide that you're going to testify God is faithful. Testify you're trusting him to the end. That's how you die triumphantly. We're all going to die unless Christ returns. Why not plan and say, God, I would like you as you pour out your dying grace upon me, I want to testify of you. David died exhorting his family to follow the Lord in 1 Kings 2. This is what David says in his deathbed. I wonder how he had enough breath to say all this. It's several verses. Observe the Lord your God, what he requires. Walk in his ways. Keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements that are written in the law of Moses so you can prosper and, and may the Lord keep his promise to me. See, he exhorted his family. 
The, the last words of David were to his family saying, I have loved and served the Lord. You love and serve the Lord. What a, what a powerful way to die. How about Stephen? I mean, you might die in persecution like he did. Stephen dies praising God. Acts 7, verse 59 as they stoned him, Stephen prayed aloud for those. Instead of gritting his teeth and, and flashing you know, anger at them, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and Lord, don't hold this sin against them. That message was very powerful because it cut to the heart of one of those witnesses. Do you remember? Saul of Tarsus. And he knew that he had killed the saints. And the Lord used that wonderful praising of Stephen. Paul died finishing the plan. In fact, 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. He says, I had a, a track the Lord laid out for me, I finished it. And he died exhorting young Timothy, finish what, don't, don't quit. Even when it's hard, finish. Peter in 2 Peter 1, 12 through 15, died reminding the saints about the word of God. He said, I always want to remind you of these things, even though uh, you know them. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know I will soon put my tent aside. How do you like that? Peter says, life is camping. Heaven is home. I'm camping. I'm, my tent's going to get rolled up. I'm going home. Peter dies reminding the saints about the word of God. Here's the last one. Christ died pointing the way for another person to come to God. You know, I've heard about that so many times of people that, that are earnestly seeking their charge nurse or their doctor or some attendant. They're more concerned about them as they die than themselves. And that's very Christ-like because do you remember what Jesus said? Assuredly, I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. He'd shared and won the thief on the cross. Well, Smyrna was in great persecution, but they stood fast through it. True believers always discover Jesus is all I have in the end to hold on to. Everything else can be taken away. Jesus is all I have. And by faith, they remain faithful to him no matter what the price is they have to pay. We, like them, can be purified by persecution. You know, sooner or later, it's going to get down that we are intolerant because we believe the word of God, we believe in Christ alone, we have a home outside of this world, and we believe that certain sins, God has said that they are wrong and that we cannot partake in them. Sooner or later, we're going to start feeling the noose ourselves. And we're, we are called by Christ to be faithful, and Christ's message for them is the same for us today. Trust me to the end. Verse 10, be faithful until death. I'll give you the crown of life. You know what that means? Keep following him to the end. The end of our lives are the greatest days of our lives, the word of God says. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And as we bow, I hope that each of us will say, Lord, I want to be faithful to the end. Father in heaven, I thank you for Smyrna. I thank you for their heritage. I thank you that they were getting crushed just like the myrrh production reflects. But Lord, they were faithful unto death. And whether we die a martyr's death or just a, a normal wear down, wear out, and everything fail death, we want to be faithful to you to the end. And Father, I pray your grace upon us as we get the privilege of telling a whole bunch of people that may never have even heard your word, delivering a gospel by John to them, inviting them to come. And Lord, as Mark exhorted us and as Dan's going to come and exhort us again, how I pray that we will be your witnesses in this very special way today. And Lord, may we, as we do it, go in the courage of fearing not and knowing that we are going to be faithful to the end. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.